Oh, no. We have one center. Thank you. They were wonderful papers. Um, my question is for um, Melissa. That's uh, Mimi, sorry. Um, I wonder how much the imagery of the um, Madame de Ventadour, given that she was, a, she was a governess, but also a governess for a child without a mother, um, how much of, is, is it possible that her imagery, to some extent, was playing on the tradition of the female regent? Yes, uh, thank you, Mimi. I would like to know, did the governess have personal notes on the um, character of the young king? Did she keep personal diary or something to note his character or not? Uh, the only commentary that I'm aware of is in the, in the letters uh, to, with uh, the exchange with Madame de Maintenon, mm. which survives in various editions, some more reliable than others, but including, in fact, 18th century letters do begin to be published, although not, necess not necessarily responsibly by modern standards, uh, in the 1750s. So there is a kind of a remythologizing of Madame de Ventadour that, that trails along with a certain rehabilitation of the reputation of Madame de Maintenon uh, when the Maintenon correspondence starts to appear in printed form in, uh, in the 1750s. Uh, so those are difficult documents to interpret. I try to be very careful not to take them literally. They're rhetorical. Uh, they are public. There would have been an understanding that they would have been shared, with, in fact, with the king. Uh, so I see them, as I, I try to suggest, as uh, Madame de Ventadour's effort to shape how her work was being perceived and to put, to, to reinforce the sense of obligation on the part of the king, uh, the gratitude for her service and the continued affirmation, uh, you know, about the quality of her service. Uh, yeah. So I'm still looking, but so far that's. Uh, Thank you very much. sent the message? Was it a, did they slip a note under the door or? <laughs> Is that on? Yes. Um, that's a good question. I'm not quite sure. Um, I think it would have been done as diplomatically as possible. In each case, she was um, moved on because somebody who was higher ranked wanted to move into that particular apartment. So she would never have made a fuss or made it difficult or made it right. difficult for them because you know that would not have been in her interests and her advantage. And in fact, in all three occasions, it was because a prince of the blood um, or one of their children needed that apartment. So I think the last time it was because the Comtesse um, de Provence wanted her apartment. And the Comtesse de Provence was actually her cousin once removed also from Turin from the rival faction, from the rival court. 
So there was that additional layer as well. And um, yes, so I, I think it would have all been handled as sensitively as possible. I'm not sure if that was done verbally or in writing, but, but yes, these, these were very um, sensitive uh, people. <laughs> I have, a, I have a question for Kimberly. I thought that was absolutely fascinating, your summary of the history of um, wigs in the uh, late 70s and early 18th centuries, or throughout the 18th century. And I'm always really interested in international comparisons. And I mean, I, I suppose one could say the wig is a, is a French um, invention, but then uh, it takes over Europe by storm almost. Um, and, um, and we were talking about this yesterday. There's a famous depiction of the King Louis XIV uh, meeting Philip V of Spain, and you can see the two different courts, the, the modern French court on the one side and the old-fashioned Spanish court on the other side, who are all sort of really stuck in their 16th century um, attire. But I wondered if you looked at the development of wigs across um, Europe and whether... Um, I mean, we, we can see that, that the, the, the English and, and the German courts and, and Italian courts, they all take on those French wigs, but do they actually develop their own wigs, I mean, independently from the French court? I, I haven't looked at them in that much detail to be able to answer that, but I, I, I mean, as you say, France set the fashions for Europe, so we do see them very quickly um, being taken up in England and um, Spain remained sort of in its little you know, 16th century Catholic bubble for a long time, and, and Italy was a whole different situation altogether, as, as a wonderful tapestry in the exhibition um, illustrates. Uh, but it, w we, we were talking about how uh, we was very fond of these sort of who wore it best images of these culture classes, clashes with ambassadors or with other, other courts, and comparing the, the very advanced, very, very decorative French to the, the not so enlightened. Retrograde fashions of, of other um, courts, but uh, interestingly, as you get further on through his reign, there's less and less difference between the visitors to Versailles and, and the actual denizens of Versailles because French style had become so uh, pervasive and, and uh, su such an international style by then. Thank you. Question at centre. Thank you all again. Um, had a question uh, for Kimberly again. Um, as the revolution started to pick up and it sort of became, you know, deathly dangerous to wear a wig, um, etc. Um, how do you think um, people like Robespierre got away with it? <laughs> yeah, he got away with a lot. <laughs> I think he was very much a special case, but I, I, I had to cut my talk a little short, but I, I did have some images there of, of David and his, his very cropped, um, unpowdered, and even uncombed hair, um, very much a supporter of the revolution, and then um, Mr. Seresa, his cousin, wearing a hat with the tiniest possible tricolor cockade on it, um, and, and very obviously powdered hair, um, possibly even a wig. Um, you were really taking your life in your hands at that point by wearing um, hair powder and, and wigs and really luxury goods of any any kind. Um, yet, as you say, with Robespierre, it did happen. Also, um, soldiers continued to powder their hair. It was, it was part of their uniform. They were given an allowance for powder. Um, so, so it, that, that, and, and again, that, I think, speaks to how much of a hygienic issue it was as well. It, it wasn't just a fashionable, a luxury product. Um, hair powder wigs did have practical uses too and I, I think that explains why they stayed in fashion for so long in, you know, in defiance of the typical pattern of fashion which is that they, they come and go um, th people were actually getting something out of wearing these things that may look ridiculous to us today but even uh, as you say that there was a hygienic element to them there was also a very unhygienic element to them from what you hear um, things living in them all sorts of yeah, there, things there like that there are these anecdotal accounts that women would have their hair kind of redone and rats would pop out or there would be things nesting in there. I, I think those are quite um, exaggerated though. I think I, I, they, they don't line up with the, the, uh, the factual record, let's say. Um, there are a few of these scattered accounts though and I, I, part of my research is going to involve trying to determine how, how true that is. Um, did women really go for weeks without having their hair redone? Mm, I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll have to uh, find some evidence for that, but right now we, all we have is sort of some satirical sort of gross out um, stories.
stories of, of women, you know, breeding mice in their hair. Did people, did women really have special pillows for keeping those uh, hairdos in, in, in uh, Right, overnight? right, stories about women sleeping, sit, sitting up so they didn't, didn't uh, disrupt their hairdos. Uh, you know, there were women in Paris who had hairdressers come to their house every day. They had them on retainer, so I, I don't think they were actually going for weeks without getting their hair redone. I, I think they were, um, if you could afford to dress in the height of fashion, you could afford to have a hairdresser come every day and give you a new hairstyle. Thank you all very much for papers which touched many moments on agency, questions of agency and questions of kind of the physicality and the agency of, of women and their proximity to touching the royal. I, I wanted to, Sarah, I, I, I was interested in, you know, your, the first assertion you made was essentially that we have to recuperate somehow the Palais de Laval from, you know, what we know of the, the reputation. And it just strikes me so interesting how, I mean, we are a century and a little bit on from all of this. Why? I mean, I mean we could say the same about Marie Lechinska, and you could say the same about a number of very important women at court that, you know, I, it may have taken until you to, see, you know, to get the inventory and dig it all up. What, what has it been that's been so powerful about the stories told about court women that we are... It only, you know, wh wh why was there such a virulent set of reactions against them? Uh, you know, because I mean, you can understand the revolution, but th this is a very persistent thread, and which has led to a lot of neglect. Have you got any thoughts about why it is? Or oh, maybe, maybe all of you have thoughts about why it is that it's taken so long to get to these particular stories? It's the way the court ended. I mean, I think. For a very long time, Marie Antoinette was seen as this profligate, um, sort of, you know, vacuous as well. Um, and even though it's, it's shown that she didn't actually spend as excessively as some of her predecessors, that that um, you know the let them eat cake sort of fantasy about Marie Antoinette has persisted because it's a fascinating story and because of her untimely and, and terrible end. But I think because of her end, all the women associated with her have also been coloured by the same tarnish and. Um, it's extraordinary as well how the sort of the 19th century, that whole mythology grows up with the sort of the royalist um, sympathy and uh, the cult of Marie Antoinette and um, the Goncourt brothers and you know the myth that they create about Marie Antoinette and her circle. Um, because um, you know at Versailles there was recently the exhibition about Madame Elisabeth, which which helps to you know, paint a much more, much richer picture of her, for instance. Um, but the Princesse de Lombal, I'm not sure why it persist It has persisted for so long. I think that there, there were 31 biographies written about her in the 19th century, and they all repeat the exact same narrative, because I think it serves their purposes, that she was this, you know, sort of simple-minded fool and sort of weepy and useless and, you know, didn't do anything very interesting. And actually, she was the head, she was the first head of an all-woman Masonic Lodge, and she was elected by her peers to that position. The Duc um, de Pintièvre, when her sister-in-law, to whom she was very close, Mademoiselle de Pintièvre, who becomes the Duchesse de Chartres, who then becomes the Duchesse d'Orléans, when she was separating from the Duc d'Orléans, the Duc de Pintièvre nominated and gave special powers to the Princess de Lombard to negotiate the terms of their separation because he put such faith in her faculties and her intellectual faculties and her diplomatic skills because she was very close to the Duke d'Orléans, although eventually she breaks with him completely. So she was not at all the person she's been shown to be. She was one of the first women to support the emerging um, professional women artists in the 18th century France as well. And um, she was a, an important musical patron, literary patron. She had an important picture collection. Um, and it's, it's hard to convey it in 20 minutes. And also, I'm just looking at Versailles, which for her, although it was her critical sphere, it was, it was something of an anomaly in that most of her important collections were not there. So I, I perhaps haven't conveyed just how rich her collections were and what an interesting collector she was. But, um, but I, you know, the myth, I think, persists because it fascinates and it scintillates and people love the idea of the ill-fated queen and her friends going to the guillotine. That's my idea. And it was at the same period in these various journalist biographies of Marie Antoinette that this story came 
about that she wore a ship in her hair, and it was so controversial, and she was, she was you know, mocking the, the French Navy, or she was you know, just spending all this money on, on these ridiculous hairstyles. And first of all, there's no evidence she ever wore that. Second of all, if she had, it would not have been a problem. It would have been a patriotic statement. Um, so it, that I think again that that period that that reaction to the revolution has really colored um, so much. And then and then the, these books have been cited over and over for the next 150 years, um, and these stories get repeated and and never really with any verification apart from these these very early sources. Interestingly, I think that the question about why Madame de Ventadour hasn't she's been hiding in plain sight this whole time. You know, <laughs> she's there, right? You saw it's. it's the other side of the coin, in a way, from the, an example like the Princesse de Lamballe. No scandal, no eroticized, threatening, scary body, no <laughs> influence over a king that was seen to be inappropriate, despite this sort of stealth regent iconography that is absolutely there, but doesn't seem to have upset anyone because it was within the bounds of a normative role of caring for a boy until he turned seven and then kissing his hand and stepping back, you know? Uh, so, I, you know, for me, that opens up another set of method questions for us, though. Uh, how are we drawn to these social subjects in the 18th century? You know, do, do we uh, want to rehabilitate the reputation of someone who has this very problematic reputation, who's been misunderstood? You know, a lot of the scholarship of Marie Antoinette or Madame de Pompadour has exactly done that, right? The last fantastic generation of scholarship, and it sounds like, you know, there are still more women who need to be recovered, whose stories need to be told properly in, in a documented way. Uh, but on the other side of that, th my project's got me thinking about um, the, the people who, as I said, are sort of hiding in plain sight, who are in a way doing their job, uh, who are being normative. Uh, and maybe there's something in our own cultural politics and how that shapes our intellectual preoccupations uh, that has made us not, perhaps not be all that interested in the normative, you know, but rather in the controversial, especially the sexually and morally controversial, the, uh, you know, sa salvaging the reputations of people who reputations, you know, have, have been so you know, damaged by historiography. Uh, so I think there's another project for us as scholars to think about the, you know, all of those folks in service to the monarchy just doing their jobs. <laughs> but they, they also have stories, and there might be some really remarkable things happening in their lives as well that can be recovered. I, I would love to invite one of you grad students to do work on the Duchesse de Chart because she's absolutely fascinating, and we, we don't have a good book on her. <laughs> and I don't want to write it. <laughs> <laughs> Just before we move on from the Duchess de, de, de Ventadour, um, could you talk a little bit more, Mimi, about the portrait? I I'm, I'm was really intrigued to notice the, the garden in the background on, on, on the right. Is it like a, an enclosed garden, like mm. a hors campus? The, the group it? portrait with the kings? Or the uh, no, no the, the, the individual portrait, the one just recently acquired by uh, mm. Versailles. It, it is some kind of um, you know, clipped, orchestrated, Absolutely, and not entirely unlike what you see in the background of the, the group portrait as well. Uh, that might not be a coincidence. That might be something to think about a little more carefully. It does suggest, uh, uh, you know, a very um, formal, if not royal, uh, setting of some kind. I'm, yeah. I'm just thinking again about the kind of Marian mythology, where you have uh, the the Virgin Mary in a garden or something like that. Is that too obscure? Do you think it's wow. more of a reference, straight reference to Versailles? That's a, you know, I hadn't thought about that, I confess. That's a really interesting thought, the idea of the, the Hortus Confusus. Um, I'll have to think about that a bit more, I'm not sure. Um, but that's really fascinating. Thanks for that suggestion. Have we any further questions from the floor? I think we probably have time for one more before we need to exit the building. Okay. Well, thank you again for three fascinating papers.